So you're here for the Data-Driven Influencer Marketing Workshop. We're going to discuss how to get stronger results from your influencer programs. And we're actually going to kick things off today with a brief poll that is largely for my benefit, but though hopefully interesting to all of you as well. I'd love to understand why everyone joined today um, and what you are looking to get out of our time together. So perhaps you're here because you're still uncertain if you're picking the most impactful influencers to work with. Maybe you think that your budget could go a little bit further than it is today. Maybe you're really overwhelmed with reporting on campaigns or your program as a whole. Or maybe after you're done with uh, you know, a campaign or a quarter, you don't really know what to do. So you, you aren't quite sure how to identify next steps after you do report on performance. Okay, interesting. So thus far, I'm seeing the most responses for picking the right people. Um, and if there's another, I'm gonna check the chat. Okay, if you have a different answer, of course, feel free. Uh, no wrong answers here. Feel free to share that in the chat too. All right, it looks like we're done voting now. Um, all right. So no matter why you are here, though it's good to know, you're definitely in the right place if you are thinking about influencer marketing for any brand at all. Uh, we have a startling to me piece of data that we uh, recently uncovered that consumers are 70% more likely to buy a product from a brand if that brand collaborates with an influencer that they know and trust, 70%. So imagine if tomorrow you had 70% more customers. Of course, it's not a one-to-one a -one, uh, correlation such as that, but it would be pretty amazing um, to have that many more customers and influencer marketing could be your the way to get there. Now, we're talking about influencer marketing, but why are we talking about data specifically? We could be running a workshop on, you know, the 10 best influencers to partner with if you are X brand. Um, but data is the key, in my opinion, to all of your success with influencer marketing. It's really the backbone of every decision that you're going to make, whether that is about partnering, reporting, scaling success, um, it helps you at every step of the way make a better decision. And it also has the potential to really alleviate any decision paralysis that you might feel. Maybe you had a great campaign last month and you really don't know how to ensure that you have a great one next month. Or you're thinking about a group of 50 people or 5,000 people for a seeding campaign, and you don't know who to choose, who's going to produce returns for the brand. Where are you going to make the best use of, of your money? So with the, the knowledge that data is the backbone of all of this, let's think specifically about influencer selection. And we all know that everything starts with finding the right people. Influencer selection is really of the utmost importance for you when you're deciding who you want to partner with um, as a brand and how you're going to make the best use of your creativity. The best ideas for campaigns, the most innovative and exciting ways of reaching an audience can fall fully flat if we have the wrong messenger, if we're not executing with the right individual. So we really need to think about who we're partnering with and ensure that we are acknowledging the nuance in that selection that who we're partnering with is not necessarily um, 
who we know already or who we think posts the most beautiful content. We want it to be objective, how we're selecting these individuals. And we want it to be database so that we can scale and replicate success again and again. So we want to think about a lot of data in selecting the right influencer. Who are they? So what kind of content do they produce? Is it, what format is it in? Where do they live? How do they describe themselves? What's their job? What are their interests? Who is their audience? Does their audience really mirror what you know to be your target market or the demographic that you are, are selling your product to? Does it align with an outage that you have? Are you having a hard time reaching that younger audience or that older audience? And does this influencer or creator's audience really overlap with that outage? Are they able to engage and not just their engagement rate, but on what platforms are they able to engage? Um, what media formats are they able to engage with? Uh, how have they performed in the past? And how have they performed in the past on that particular platform? Is it different when they've done something sponsored compared to when they just organically post? Did they recently go viral for the wrong reason or the right reason? Looking at historical performance and using that to predict future success. And then of the utmost importance, can they pass brand safety checks for you? Do they espouse values that truly align with your brand's values? Are they going to refrain from saying things that might give the wrong association to the general public about your brand or assume that you also reflect those views? And that's critically important to consider for anyone who's going to be talking about our brand and indicate that they were paid or gifted by us because we are, you know, creating that association in consumers' minds. Um, I also, okay. One second. I just wanted to mention that this is being recorded. I meant to mention that at the beginning, but you'll receive a recording after this. Um, but now we're going to go into an example, a poll um, in a moment that will help us sort of bring this selection, data-driven selection to life. So in this example, we're all pretending that we work for a mid-sized beauty brand that we're focused on the US market. And we want to see product, specifically a lipstick, to build awareness for our brand. Now we have these two images to choose from in deciding who our target's going to be. We have Danielle and Christine, and we can see some engagement metrics on these images. We can also see, you know, the aesthetic that they produce. Danielle has her fuzzy rug and eucalyptus. Christine has just a shot of the lipstick as the still frame. And based off of this, I'm really curious who you would pick. Which of these influencers, knowing that I gave you very little. Oh. Danielle. All right. Uh, getting a little bit more Christine, but Danielle is definitely the winner thus far. Full disclosure, Danielle was also my pick. Okay, someone wouldn't pick either. Interesting. All right. Okay, so going back here. Oh, I lost my slides for a second. Um, I also had initially picked Danielle. I really liked her eucalyptus. But then I dug a little bit deeper into the data behind them and I changed my mind. So we're looking at some stats about both of these individuals. First is the tier that they fall into. They're both micro level influencers. They have less than 50,000 followers, more than 10,000 followers. Danielle has a little bit smaller of an audience than Christine, but not super significantly smaller. That alone is not going to sway me one way or the other. Things do start to fall apart when we look at their engagement rate. So Danielle has a lower engagement rate. 
Christine has a higher engagement rate. Now that could, we could dig into that more. There is some nuance behind that. So that alone is not going to make my decision. What really starts to steer me in one direction is the audience geo. So remember, I am focusing on the US market in this example, and I can see that less than half of Danielle's audience is actually in the US, whereas 90% of Christine's is. So that's fairly significant. And then less than half of Danielle's audience is in the US, and it's only 60% credible. So I'm looking at less than 50% in the U.S. and 40% of her audience being bots who can't buy lipstick or anything else. Whereas Christine has really commendable audience credibility, 84% of her audience is credible. The occupation is fine. Really, everyone can purchase lipstick. Um, definitely don't want to shade nurses or PR specialists in any way, but Christine also has a slam dunk there with fashion stylists and makeup artists. So in looking at these two, at least for me, my initial bias was sort of refuted by the data, and I decided instead that I would be focusing on, on Christine. Now, engagement rate is not really the end all be all that it maybe once was considered to be. We used to think of engagement rate and follower count as like the only metrics that mattered within influencer marketing. And I think now we are much more aware. Oh, okay, we're getting some good questions uh, here about engagement rate. Okay. Stephanie's answering them. Thank you. Um, okay, I'm gonna. We'll. I'll touch on those at the end. Um, but for we do have a lot of ways to to get that data. All of it came from Tracker, um, and that's how I was able to see the occupations, etc. I just want to touch on those questions that you're asking. Um, okay. All right, going back to this. So we used to think that partnering with the influencer with the biggest following was going to be the best way for us to make a splash. That really we needed to find someone who had millions of followers and that's how we would make people aware of our brand. That's how people would engage with our brand, et cetera. We now know that that is not necessarily true. And across the brands that we work with, we're actually seeing a huge uptick from micro influencers in terms of the engagement that they're able to get for a brand, how many, how frequently they post, how many video views, et cetera, um, which is exciting as they can be more accessible to work with. Um, and there are a lot of them. But it's actually even more nuanced than that. So I focused a bit on engagement right there. And we want to go below that or beyond that. It's sort of like a layer cake. And realize that though engagement rate is still important, as the way people consume information and the platforms and media types that they consume information from is changing and evolving, engagement rate is not always the best performance metric for us to consider. Video view rate has sort of come racing in as new platforms have appeared. And we're seeing that 45% of consumers now say that short videos are the most interesting content type for them. I'm sure you all experience this on your own social platforms for the brands that you work with, that we see a massive amount of short form videos. So looking at video view rate can be a better metric for us to leverage in order to determine who would be the best person for us to partner with. And then it's even more layered than that because 45% of consumers say that short videos are the most interesting content type, but Gen Z are more likely to find long videos more engaging than millennials. So if my market outage is coming from Gen Z, and I need to capture the attention of that audience, then I might want to find some influencers who create really um, impactful long form videos that have high video view rates. So again, data can provide the answer to me in terms of where I should go next. Now this one isn't gonna have a poll, 
Hopefully everyone can see it this time, but we're going to play this game one more time, this time being a sustainable swimwear brand um, in the U.S., wanting to seed product and build awareness for our brand on Instagram. We're looking at these two individuals. They both very, very clearly say sustainable swim over their images. Um, so you know, check there. They're talking about an issue that's close to our heart as a sustainable swimwear brand. We can see that, you know, in many respects, they fit a similar demographic from what we can just look at. Uh, one is inside and one is outside. We can see some metrics under their posts. But again, diving a little bit deeper into the the, the data behind these individuals, we can see what sets them apart. So one thing that's not on this screen that is relevant to what we just talked about is their video view rate. We're able to calculate that through our platform. And Caitlin has an exponentially higher video view rate than Amy, despite having less than half of the audience size that Amy does. So the videos that she puts out are very compelling to her audience. She has a high video view rate, whereas Amy has a bigger audience, but a lower video view rate. The geography of their audience is not as disparate as in the last example. That's not super concerning to me, but things really do fall apart when we look at the demo, the demographic information behind their audience. So I'm not going to say that, you know, male identifying people cannot buy bikinis because that's not at all true, but I am going to make the assumption that if you are a sustainable swimwear brand that is trying to sell bikinis, that you're largely targeting a female identifying population. And if you're doing that and you're looking here, you're going to see that Amy actually has an 80% male audience whereas Caitlin has an 86% female audience and much higher credibility from her audience than Amy has. So 33% credibility is pretty low. That's a lot of bot followers. And where really things are solidified here is with the brand affinity. So when we think of the top sustainable fashion brands, I bet that almost all of us would have Everlane, Reformation, and Patagonia on our lists. I love these brands that Amy's followers like uh, for Love and Lemons, Adidas, and Gucci, but they're not necessarily associated with the top sustainable brands in all of our minds. So if we're going to be targeting someone who's going to reach an audience that is hungry for sustainable swimsuits, we want to find someone that really engages the right demographic for us who likes other sustainable brands and are more apt to make a purchase. Um, okay. I am having a hard time keeping up with the chat. I love to see it. I hope that you're getting the answers that you need. And if you're not, that you'll put them in the Q&A and I promise I'll cover them in the end. All right, moving on to influencer fees. So there is a cost associated with seeding, of course. Um, and I don't want to, suddenly I just got a lot bigger. I'm not sure why. That's okay. Um, uh, I don't want to uh, negate that cost. And I do think it's a mistake for brands to not calculate the cost of fees, uh, of, um, of products that you're seeding or things like that when you're thinking about how much a return on your investment in different relationships that you get. But of course, we are also sometimes paying creators and influencers directly a flat fee to post about our brand, or we're inviting them to an event, um, or we're paying for their hotel or, or things like that. And we need to leverage data in those situations as well to ensure that we are making the most efficient use of our spend. We don't want to go into a conversation and say, how much do you charge? or uh, just offer them something without any justification. We really want to look at their past performance, see how engaging they've been when talking about our brand, other brands of our ilk, specific topics, um, specific content types, and establish baselines based off of 
spend efficiency metrics, which I think are far too often overlooked in this space. I'm really surprised often at the amount of money that brands are spending on influencers and influencer relationships without really knowing how efficient their spend is. So we need to know how much that's going to cost us per impression, per engagement, per view, and allocate budget and negotiate compensation commensurately. Now, of course, um, initially you might not have, if you haven't paid this person in the past, you don't have an example from your brand, but there are ways to um, make an educated guess or guess or estimate of payment and use that to inform what your offer is going to be and the window. So how much are you willing to overspend compared to what the data tells you to spend? What is a really good value for you? And when you find a really good value, how are you going to reallocate the budget that you have left over? So we don't have a ton of... Um, data behind these two people to help us make a decision here, but we might just have an assumption based off of the image of how much each of them would cost to partner with. And we can leverage data to really find an accurate fee to enter into the conversation with. And we're going to use their engagement rate, their video view rate, and also their cost CPM, their cost per thousand engagements or cost per thousand video views. And based off of that, we would estimate that Sohini would be a little bit more expensive to work with for a photo or a video than Chloe would be. But that's not necessarily telling us, okay, go with Chloe right away. She's the cheaper option. Because we would want to, again, dig into that full picture of the data and understand which of these two reaches my target market. Which of these two is going to, you know, get more engagements, more views on the content that I am having them put out or that they're going to put out? Which one resonates and is more safe for my brand? And then justify the spend with all of that data behind you. Every time you run a campaign, you have an opportunity to learn, if nothing else. Hopefully, you also have an opportunity to celebrate, but data can help you identify where to improve. And as I mentioned or referred to a little bit earlier, there's really three key areas for measurement. I'm assuming that all of you are measuring performance for your influencers and the campaigns that you're working with. I encourage all of you to be digging deeper into spend efficiency if you're not already, do already doing that. And then, of course, there's those cost equivalency metrics that tend to be that, you know, nice little bow that we can tie things up in to look at one unified number, report to executives, understand at a macro level how things are trending. We've broken them down into what falls into each of these categories. Performance has the most metrics in it. At the bottom is conversion sales. And that's, you know, the most obvious. Was this campaign successful? Did it produce a lot of sales? I empathize with you and I'm sorry if that's all you're judged on internally. I do think that you can use data to tell a bigger story about what influencer marketing is doing beyond just a one-to-one -one sale conversion. Of course, we want that. That's going to be the outcome of effective selection and effective campaigns. But we're also going to be raising awareness, having more people talking about us, uh, more people engaging with our content, which really strongly indicates that they're considering us. And then we want to look at that spend efficiency. How much is it costing us per click that we're getting on a link, per engagement, per view, as well as, of course, those cost equivalency metrics. And from here, we're able to compare our investments and determine future allocations. Some of the most exciting work that I see on my end is when we're able to look back at a year of data and understand really 
what we should be aiming for as a CPE with each tier of influencer. What does good look like to us? And how can we use that to proactively select influencers and plan out our campaigns, et cetera, for the year ahead? So we need to know which influencers are performing best in campaigns, which campaigns are driving the best return, what the overall efficiency of influencer marketing is for our brand. And if we can use data to determine this, we can be more active in those overall marketing mix conversations and ensure that influencer marketing isn't, you know, sort of a neglected black box from our executive team, but instead has a seat at the table and can contribute to the marketing budget conversations and is really valued as a key channel of investment. Now, uh, this is complex. I, I'm assuming some of you are thinking about influencer marketing this way, but not all of you. And I hope to bring it to life a little bit more with this example of how a consumer brand, this is a real life example, optimizes spend and maximizes their ROI. So first, they're going to be focusing on quality, not quantity. So it's not necessarily just working with more and more individuals. It's working with the right people. They're definitely leveraging historical benchmarks so that they can predict what will be successful for them um, and check their assumptions each time. And along the way, they're always iterating. They're developing new benchmarks to inform their future campaigns and think about what they can be doing differently. So in this example, we're looking at the global spend allocation by tier for this brand. How much of their overall pot of money for influencer marketing is going into each tier of influencer, into investing in each tier of influencer. And we can see that the largest piece of the pie here is their top tier influencers. They're investing 40% of their overall influencer budget in those top tiers. We can also see their cost per video view by tier. So again, we, we're thinking more about videos now, about video views being a really uh, effective way to calculate the you know, impact of the work that you're doing. And we can see that they actually have the lowest cost per video view for those top tiers. So they're spending the most money on them, but they are the most efficient. And then we can see that their cost per view per platform for TikTok, which is all videos, is going down year over year. So they're more efficient on that channel with their top tier influencers. In looking at this data, this brand was able to conclude that if they actually reallocated $10,000 from their micro tier influencers to those top tier influencers, that they could gain 833,000 more views. It's a lot more views, especially when we think back to that 70% stat that we had at the beginning. How many more people are going to be seeing content about our brand from a top tier influencer that they recognize and that they probably trust if they're following their content. It's a lot more views for uh, our product, for our brand, a lot more people considering us. Now, it's not always the solution to invest more in people with a large following, of course. Um, it's, it's not as one-to-one -one as that. Uh, I was going to say I wish it was that simple, but I don't because I like that there's a, a spread here. So in this example, we're going to be thinking about if we had $25,000 more to invest in a campaign, what would be the best way to spend it? Now, we're not looking at any images here. We're just seeing influencer A and influencer B. In this example, they're both influencers that we've partnered with in the past. And we can see their following number their total views, their cost per video, so how much we've had to pay them per video, their total, the total spend that we made on each of them, and how many deliverables they've produced for us. 
So that was then, you know, the campaign ended. Now we have 25 more, 25,000 more dollars to inject into it. I said 25 more dollars. That's funny. Um, and we want to decide who we should be partnering with. So we might make the assumption right off the bat, Influencer A has 5 million followers. We're going to, you know, invest in more videos with Influencer A. But actually, if we take a deeper look, we will know that with $25,000, we could get seven more videos from Influencer B than we could from Influencer A. So we would actually get a higher view rate over time and have much more awareness for our brand, for the product. We would need to ensure that these videos were unique in nature, that it's not a copy paste, maybe they're on different platforms, they have different themes, et cetera. But influencer B with the smaller following would actually be the smarter investment for us in this situation. Now, our customers at Tracker know this and they achieve more per dollar invested by optimizing their roster. They don't uh, necessarily spend more money. In fact, they usually uh, decrease their spending by 50%, but they do activate three times more influencer relationships, generate four times more content, and earn five times more engagements on that content. So in conclusion, I really want to encourage all of you to truly lead with data at every step of the way, ensuring that you're referencing data whenever you can, from selection to measurement to overall annual reporting, how you're going to be talking to the powers that be in your organization, and how you're thinking about improving next time. Now, as a last poll, I'd love to hear from all of you in terms of what you would like us to cover next in a next workshop. We'll probably eventually cover all of these topics, but which of these themes, selection, fees, or reporting, is are you most hungry to uh, dive deeper into? And I'll let the poll go. All right. Okay. So thank you. Thanks for being so responsive. Thanks for being so busy in the chat. Um, I'm eager to hear more of your questions. This is, as I mentioned, my first time using Goldcast, and I thought that I'd be able to be more attentive, but turns out I'm not the, the multitasker I uh, took myself for. But I do see that we have some questions over here in the Q&A. Uh, okay, fantastic. What is the best method for reporting on the success of your influencer marketing program across campaigns and across markets? Is there a single metric for this or is it a combination of different things? So thank you for this question, Nicole. I'm not sure exactly at what point in the presentation it was posited. I would definitely say that it is a combination. Um, a single metric can be helpful in reporting to executives or looking at overall trends over time, but it is not sufficient in really understanding opportunities for improvement in your program, why you have been successful in one area and less successful in another. And I think that you need to be looking at those three different buckets of metrics. So how are we performing with all of the performance metrics? How efficient is our spend, whether that's from seeding or direct payment or commissions, et cetera. And then those cost equivalency metrics that tend to be that single metric. But it depends on the type of content, the level of influencer, et cetera. Um, and I think it's a little bit different depending on your context as a brand. So definitely something worth diving deeper into um, when I have that understanding and I can answer more. I hope that helped. 
if we want to move on to a next question. Data from what all social platforms do you capture on influencer performance? So I think this is asking me what platforms Tracker captures data on, I think. Um, we cover 13 platforms, all of the major social platforms that have uh, publicly available information. So when I say that, I'm meaning like Snapchat doesn't have an API, so we can't capture that. But Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, TikTok, uh, YouTube, Vimeo, Reddit, Pinterest, um, et cetera. How do you know if the audience is credible? Um, so this is a nuanced answer, uh, but you can look at statistically significant behaviors of followers of influencers um, to help you understand if that's how a real person acts or how a bot acts. Now you, Susanna, would have a really hard time doing that at scale, of course, like looking into all of the followers of someone that you're considering and then tracking them online to see what their behaviors are. Uh, I leverage the tracker platform to find that data and we show you that for influencers that you're considering, the um, credibility of their audience as well as the psychographic and demographic information about them. For the influencer comparison, how can you tell the engagement rate is bigger for Christine? Um, also by looking at Tracker. So I looked at her overall engagement rate for the past six months and then on examples of groups of posts. I, I was not able to show, it wasn't a full product demo, so you didn't see everything that we saw in putting it together. That question makes a lot of sense. Thanks, Taylor. If we do not compensate influencers with money, how could we measure efficiency of spend? This is a good question and one that is um, close to my heart too. So do you send product to influencers? Do you invite them to events uh, or experiences? Um, do you share codes with them where they can drive purchases if you have an affiliate program? All of these things provide data points that help you measure efficiency of your overall spend. And if, for example, you're sending product, you can quantify the cost of that product, either what it retails for or how much it costs you, and use that to calculate the efficiency of the spend. I don't want to negate the time and effort that you and other people put into managing these programs, too. Um, and that is a more qualitative piece that doesn't tend to resonate as much with uh, executives, but you know that is a, a, a factor in all of this. But when we're calculating spend efficiency, we're usually looking at costs of gifts and services or actual flat fees or commissions that we're paying to influencers. Analysis of past performance is possible for any influencer in the platform. Um, in the tracker platform, yes. So if the influencer has been posting, uh, like, you know, say they had an Instagram since last year, you're able to look back in time and analyze their performance. So we provide historical data as well. Where do you extract those analytics from? Even raw data. All of the analytics that I shared were from the tracker platform. Well, some percentages and things were from outside studies like with Gartner um, and other partners. I don't know if I fully understand this question and I'm happy to dive deeper into it afterwards. My apologies. Um, yeah, so there are a lot of brands that do this type of data-driven analysis well. Um, we have a lot of examples on our website of brands that are using data to analyze their performance, and we have stories from them and interviews. Um, 
A recent example that comes to mind is Shiseido. Uh, that's a brand that really leverages data across every aspect of their program to ensure that they can improve campaign over campaign. Um, we work across the whole family of brands at L'Oreal, and there are some examples within there that do it exceptionally well, um, but I would say that it's mandated that they all leverage data to the uh, extent that it can be in order to ensure their success at an organizational level. Um, I'm really impressed with how Adidas leverages data as well. Uh, they, uh, their analytics team is very invested in extracting the right data points um, from the tracker platform to ensure that they are being as efficient as possible with their spend across tier of influencer. I'm happy to go in deeper on this. There's a lot of examples. Okay. How well does tracker work? Okay. So we are a truly global platform. Um, we cover, I think it's 26 or 28 languages uh, that you can search within and surface information within. We also benchmark globally. We are a true benchmark um, where you're looking at the actual market size and everyone talking about your brand instead of like a panel of people that we have decided are the people to benchmark with. Um, so yes, you can use Tracker to surface individuals in ex-US markets. What I mean by surface is identify new relationships and influencers and certainly to track. A unique aspect of Tracker is that everything is keyword or content level based. So when you are analyzing or measuring, it doesn't have to be with a hashtag or an at mention of a brand. It could be like a full phrase or a keyword that is in any language that you want or an emoji, et cetera. I don't wanna get, um, I hope that wasn't too salesy. I really don't wanna be salesy in this conversation, but I do want you to know that we, are the platform for global brands. We work in many different languages and it's not an issue. Thanks, Ralph. Um, yes, so there are industry standards. Actually, I don't know if it's Caroline or Carolyn, um, but I would love to chat more with you about this. We had two new, um, uh, data points or publications this week. So we are able to set standards for your brand by analyzing historical content and looking at what success was for you. We do this for many of our clients um, by looking at all of their relationships over the past year, two years, seeing what worked and what didn't and what are the standards for you. But there are many different places where you can uh, reference industry standards in terms of fees, what good CPMs are, et cetera. So I can help you dig deeper into this. When do you know that it's time to end a working partnership? Oh, good question, Kate. So I think that this is data and heart. And I've had some tough conversations in the past uh, the most repeated are when it's a midsize or smaller brand that the founder has a really close relationship with some people that are influencers, and it's really hard to let that go. And I think that the nature of the relationship could change. Maybe you need to tell that person, hey, we really we've done some analysis and we see that we are missing out on this market of consumers and we need to start working with these people, but we'll still continue to send you some product. Um, but the data again is going to tell you if they are having a really high cost per engagement per video for you, view for you, they're not performing in line with other individuals that you're working with and you're just not seeing basic performance or it's an inefficient use of your spend. Maybe you give it one more try and see if that was a bad campaign for them, a bad month, a bad time, but then you need to pretty quickly make a call on that. And you can always revisit that partnership. Maybe things will change in a year um, and you can remember what happened in the past and try again in a new time. But I, I think you shouldn't, if someone's not performing well 
or they're costing you too much money, you shouldn't keep going back to that relationship again and again, expecting different results. That's not what the data is going to bear out. Yes, very basic question about tracker. And yes, you can. Oh, OK. It looks like that's all of our questions for today. Of course, there are a lot of um, case by case examples. Each of you have your own unique situation. And I am in no way trying to say that there's one way to do everything. I, I just am trying to say that data is applicable to every program, every influencer partnership um, that you might be considering. So don't hesitate to message me. I'd love to chat more about your unique situation, pain points, the data story that you need to share. Um, I'm here for you. And do reference the Tracker website. We have a bunch of really wonderful stories on there um, that are good learning points. And then just thank you so much for spending the time with me today. I really appreciate it.